The Peter Schiff Show. This morning we got the release of the July non-farm payroll report and the general consensus among the analysts seemed to be that it was a strong report, a solid report. I saw Larry Kudlow uh, this morning on Fox Business talking about another solid performance in job creation. But once again, once you look beneath the surface, uh, and you don't have to look too deep, and it's actually not even great on the surface, this is not a good report. I mean, first of all, the bar was set pretty low. The consensus was 151,000 jobs. So that's not a lot of jobs. Uh, so it's not that hard to beat it. And we did. We got 164,000 jobs. But the reason we beat it was because we created more government jobs than the market expected. For private payrolls, the consensus was 160,000 jobs being created, and we only created 148,000 jobs. So we created 12,000 fewer private sector jobs than had been expected, and we made up the difference by creating government jobs, whether they're for the federal government or state government. But there's a very big difference between private sector jobs and public sector jobs in that the taxpayer isn't on the hook to pay the salaries of the private sector workers, right? I mean, they're working in companies that are generating profits. And so the salaries are paid for by the profits that the businesses generate. But the government doesn't generate any profit. It just has to suck up tax revenue. Uh, so we have to pay for these. So it's not a good thing that government gets more bloated and hires more people especially since a lot of government bureaucrats tend to complicate things. Uh, they make everybody less efficient, right? If we're hiring more regulators to slow down the economy and get in everybody's way, that's not a good thing. I mean, I'd rather have a lean, mean government. Of course, that's not going to happen. Uh, but that would mean that the government uh, has fewer bureaucrats on the payroll to harass people in the private sector. So more people working productively in the private sector is good for the economy because they're adding to the productivity. They're providing services or helping to produce goods. But having more people working for the government, now those people can't produce goods. They're no longer available to work productively. They're now working for the government. And now they're uh, an inhibiting factor. They're actually uh, slowing down. They're making the private sector's workers less productive and less efficient. So the fact that we hired more people uh, for the government is not a good thing. And of course, where does the government get the money to pay for these extra workers? Well, it borrows it, right? That's what's going on, right? Because we're running these huge deficits. So right off the bat, that wasn't good. But then we had big revisions uh, to the prior numbers. Remember the number that we got for June? Everybody thought it was so great because it was 220 4,000 jobs. Right? Oh, it's more than 200,000, right? Everybody was excited about that. Well, remember at the time, I didn't believe that number. I said, let's see how the revisions come out. Well, now they've revised it down to 193,000. So it's still, I think, maybe a little bit higher than what had been expected, but not nearly as much as the initial report. And of course, we don't know uh, you know, what the next set of revisions is going to be because they didn't only revise uh, June they revised May. Uh, they revised down the last couple of months. I think the total of revisions was 31,000 jobs. So 31,000 fewer jobs were created in the last two months than was originally reported. And so how do we know that the 164,000 jobs that was reported this month won't also be revised down? So we can't really celebrate that the number beat the consensus but we haven't had the revisions yet. In fact, most of the revisions that we have been getting have been down. And that's typically what happens as you're going into a recession. The government finds out that they have been overestimating the statistics. In fact, when you find out that you're in a recession is when they go back and they really revise down the numbers that they previously reported. I mean, that's what happened with the beginning of the Great Recession. Uh, we didn't even realize we were in a recession until we were more than six months into it 
because the government went back six months and revised all the data and said, oh, we told you all this data was good, but actually we were wrong. It was terrible. We were actually in a recession, even as we were telling you that we were creating all these jobs and we had all this great data. Now that we went back and looked, we were completely wrong. The jobs weren't created. We actually lost jobs. The economy actually contracted. We, the numbers were wrong. So we have no idea if these numbers are correct. But even if they don't revise the number, even if it stands at the 164, it really isn't a beat when you take into consideration the jobs that were taken away from the prior two months. So overall, fewer jobs were created. The unemployment rate held steady at 3.7. Uh, they were anticipating that it would go down to 3.6. Now, one reason that the unemployment rate stayed the same is the labor force participation rate did tick up to 63%. So uh, the good news is a few people uh, who were on the sidelines decided to come back into the labor market. Of course, the bad news is that the majority of those people were over 55 years old. In fact, we had a huge jump in the labor force participation rate for workers 55 and older. It's now at the highest level in seven years. And when older people are going into the workforce, it is not a good sign, right? Because older people are hoping to leave the workforce, not enter the workforce. So typically, if you got 60, 65, 70, 80 year old people who are working, it's because they're under a lot of financial stress, right? They don't want to spend their golden years at the golden arches, but that's what's happening because they, they can't afford to buy food or medicine or pay their rent. They have inadequate savings for retirement. Uh, their interest that they're earning is not adequate. Or they, you know, the Social Security, whatever they're getting. And so they need to take a job. And the fact that older workers are forced into the labor market when they prefer uh, to enjoy uh, their golden years and spend time uh, with their grandchildren and just enjoy what's left of their life, right? That's the whole idea. The fact that they can't do that, that they can't afford to do that is not a good sign. In fact, another interesting statistic in the numbers was the surge in the number of people who are working multiple jobs. That number jumped, I think it was 233,000 uh, increase in the month. Uh, we now have a record high of 8.389 million people who are working multiple jobs. And again, most people don't want to have multiple jobs. I mean, most people don't even want their first job, but they need that one, right? They got to cover their cost of living, right? So they have a job, but you know, you hope that your job covers it. You don't want to have to take a second job. So to the extent that more Americans are forced to moonlight, right? That their, their first job isn't providing enough income after taxes to cover their costs, that now they need to get a second job. That is not a good thing. And a lot of the jobs that were created were second jobs. They were jobs that went to people who already had jobs. So that's another reason that the unemployment rate doesn't go down because these people weren't unemployed, right? They already had a job uh, and now they have another job. Although one kind of dichotomy here, which doesn't make sense. If you look at the household survey for the month, there was a very big jump in full-time jobs and the increase in part-time jobs was relatively small uh, compared to what we had been doing. So this would suggest that, okay, we're creating some better jobs because we're getting more full-time jobs than part-time jobs. But again, that doesn't even really make sense because a lot of people who are getting second jobs, I have a hard time believing that their second job is a full-time job unless their original job was just a part-time job and now they've got a full-time job because most people can't work two full-time jobs. So to the extent that people are taking a second job, you would assume that it would be a, a part-time job. So again, you know, a lot of these numbers don't really make sense anyway. And I don't trust the government numbers because remember, so many of these numbers uh, that we're using anyway uh, are you know just assumed into existence based on the birth death model, right? And, you know, those things get changed, you know, a year later, they go back and maybe make those adjustments because the government simply assumes that businesses are being started and they assume that those businesses are hiring people. Well, how do they know that the businesses are actually getting started? And how do they know that they're hiring people? I mean, maybe they're trying to avoid hiring people. And of course, 
if you're biased, right, if the guys over at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, if uh, if these guys think that the economy is great, well, they're naturally going to assume that businesses are forming, right? But if we're actually headed to recession and no one in the government knows that, then maybe their assumptions, their bias is, is impacting uh, the birth death model. And they should be assuming businesses are dying, but instead they keep believing that they're being born. So the whole thing doesn't make sense. And also look at the hours worked, right? If more people are getting full-time jobs, why did the hours work go down, right? It went down from 34.4 to 34.3. So people are working fewer hours, uh, which would suggest maybe fewer uh, full-time jobs. Although the biggest reduction in hours work came for factory workers. I forget the exact number, but I think it plunged down to like the lowest level in 2000, since 2011 or something like that. So the factories are really hurting. And we already know that, right? A lot of that has to do with the trade war, which is escalating, uh, at, but the general economic slowdown that we have. Getting to average hourly earnings, a lot of people look at that number, right, for clues as to what the Fed is gonna do. Here, we actually came in a little bit hotter than had been estimated because the prior increase of 0.2 was increased to an increase of 0.3, and the current month, which was also expected to come in at up 0.2, well, that also came out at up 0.3. So we have back-to-back 0.3% gains in average hourly earnings, right? Which, which would suggest some type of pickup potentially in inflation if you're seeing the price of labor going up. Yet the Federal Reserve, right, just this week cut interest rates supposedly because there's not enough inflation. Yet the data that we're seeing on prices suggests that inflation pressures are building just as the Fed claims they're receding and it's using that as an excuse for cutting rates. You know, so overall, when you look at the jobs numbers, the fact that we barely beat and we didn't beat at all, if you factor in the downward revisions, when you take a look at the fact or consider the fact that the entire beat was the result of more people being employed by the government, even though we missed on uh, the private sector, when you see the decline in, in hours work and just consider all of the factors in this labor report, this is not a strong report. I mean, I don't know what Larry Kudlow is smoking, although actually it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the report is. Kudlow is going to be you know, optimistic on it because that's his job, right? His job is to make lemonade out of lemons. You know, no matter how many lemons you give him, it's always going to be lemonade. And so he comes on uh, in order to just, you know, talk up the economy and pretend that Trump is doing this fantastic job. You know, I was watching on uh, Fox Business, I think it was on Charles Payne's show, and you had the several Fox News hosts that were on there, including Neil Cavuto and uh, Lou Dobbs. And of course, neither of these guys will let me on their shows anymore. I used to do Cavuto uh, a long time ago, and I used to I used to do Lou Dobbs. I mean, he used to really like having me on. Of course, now you know he wouldn't dream of having me on because I'm I don't you know I'm not drinking all the Trump Kool Aid. Although nobody on 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 Fox News will have me on. I get on again. I got on with uh, Liz Clayman on Fox Business, and I do Charles Payne's show. He ha he's had me on a couple of times, uh, and then and this was Charles's show. But the interesting thing was that, um, and you can see this. On, on YouTube, the, the, uh, the interview is up there. But um, they're discussing Trump, and Lou Dobbs is talking about how great Trump is and how fantastic the economy is. And then Neil Cavuto, right, actually tries to make a valid point. But what about all the debt? What about the increase in government spending and, 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 and the debt? And then Lou Dobbs just says, but the economy is great. The economy is booming. Unemployment is low. And then Cavuto interrupts and says, okay, Lou, I'm not asking you about that. I'll concede that. What about the debt? What about government spending? And then he starts going off again. The economy is great. Unemployment is low. Wages are rising. The president is doing a great job. He keeps ignoring uh, Cavuto's question. And then when Cavuto interrupts him to say, yeah, but Lou, I'm, I'm not asking about that. Can you please address the debt? Are you telling, are you saying that the president is doing a good job of that? And then, and then Dobbs just keeps getting mad at Cavuto 
for interrupting him, even though the only reason Cavuto is interrupting him is because he's not asking his question. He's avoiding the question. And it really does bother me. I said this on the podcast I did yesterday, that so many Republicans are so loyal to Trump, they don't even realize he's a Democrat. They don't even realize he's a big spending uh, gov- you know, Democrat who's now working with the liberal Democrats in Congress to make government bigger. They're working on an infrastructure bill right now that's going to pass with uh, Democratic support. It probably will not get the votes of the Republicans, right? It'll pass because Trump is willing to sign a bill that passes based on the Democrats being in favor of it. I mean, there'll be enough Republicans uh, that'll cross over, right? That'll vote with the Democrats so it will pass and then Trump is going to sign it. But, you know, why is he constantly getting a pass, particularly on, on the debt, and not only the fact that the debt's going up, but what's driving it, this massive increase in government spending. And again, you know, Cavuto wanted to give Trump high marks for the tax cuts. Look, I don't give him high marks for the tax cuts because if the tax cuts are paid for by borrowing money, then they're not even tax cuts. They're a fraud because government is still spending the money. And so if you're not going to pay for the government with taxes, well, then you're paying for it with debt and inflation, which is an even more expensive way to fund the government. Anyway, getting back to the numbers, though, I mean, the jobs number was not the only bad news that came out today, even though it wasn't greeted as bad news. Right. I mean, if we actually got a employment number that, you know, missed estimates, if we got a really low number, or if we got a negative number, right, everybody would have known it was bad. Uh, and then the markets would have reacted. I think the dollar would have got hit hard. I think gold would have taken off. But because everybody was able to pretend that it was a good number, well, you know, the charade lives on. The narrative continues about why we have this, you know, this great U.S. economy. But look at the other numbers that came out today. We did get the international trade uh, deficit for June, and it was a slight improvement over the deficit in May, which was revised downward from $55.5 billion to 55.3. But the consensus was for a deficit of 54.7 for June, and instead we got 55.2. So even if you factor in the downward revision to last month, based on the beat from this month, uh, the deficits come out higher uh, than the market expected. And this, again, this is bad news. We are losing on trade. In fact, I was reading an article today about how Uh, The Chinese are now starting to order all these soybeans from Brazil. Uh, And so now Brazil is going to be eating into our soybean market. You know, I heard Trump on a press conference today, again, repeating the lie uh, that Americans are not paying uh, for these tariffs, right? That the Chinese are paying for all the tariffs, even though they're not. And he's saying that it doesn't matter that the the farmers are going to be whole. The farmers aren't going to lose anything because we're going to take some of all the money we're collecting from the Chinese. Like we're collecting all this money from the Chinese and we're going to take a tiny bit of that money and we're going to make the farmers whole for all the, the sales that they're losing, which is, you know, there's several lies in that because we're not collecting any money from the Chinese. We're collecting money from American taxpayers. And the um, and then what basically what Trump is saying is, I'm levying a tax on American consumers, right? Because I'm forcing them to pay the tariffs. And then I'm going to level another tax on American consumers to bail out the farmers. Because in retaliation for the taxes that Americans are paying, the Chinese are not buying American agricultural products. So now the farmers are losing out on sales. And now Trump says, well, we're going to give you money. We're basically going to put the farmers on welfare. Well, who gets the bill for the welfare? It's not the Chinese. It's the Americans. I mean, Trump wants to pretend that all this government is being paid for by the Chinese, which is great because the Chinese don't vote. So if Trump can convince Americans that they're not actually paying their taxes, that the Chinese are paying it, well, then they won't object to the taxes. But the reality is that Americans are, in fact, paying the taxes. And every time Trump says otherwise, he is just lying. But again, you know, all of the supporters refuse to call him out even though he is obviously lying. I mean, listen to any uh, retailer. I was watching a guy uh, from the shoe industry today, and he was asked, well, who pays these tariffs on the shoes? The Chinese or American consumers? He's like, American consumers. Well, he ought to know 
They're selling the shoes. These are shoe companies. They import the shoes and they see that the higher prices are being passed on to the American shoe buyer. They're not being paid in China. They're being paid here. This whole thing is a fraud. Yet the president just gets away with it. You know, it really is too bad that, you know, with this kind of popularity, at least among Republicans, that Trump is squandering uh, his popularity and the bully pulpit. He could actually be doing good. He could actually be draining the swamp instead of making it deeper. You know, he could be cutting government spending instead of, you know, making government bigger. He could be tackling the deficits. He could be doing something about entitlements. He could actually be doing good. He could actually do something to make America great, but he's not. He couldn't care less. All he's trying to do is get reelected. What good is that? Was that the reason we voted for Trump? So he can campaign for four more years and just be a politician instead of the statesman that people had hoped it would be? Let's look at the factory orders. We got that number out today. We got June factory orders and the consensus was up 0.8 and we were only up 0.6. So a weaker number than was expected. But of course, what was even worse than that is that the prior month's number, which was originally reported as down 0.7, that was revised to down 1.3. Uh, so we rebounded from an even lower number and we rebounded uh, by a smaller rebound. Uh, so again, this is very weak. In fact, this is, you know, back-to-back -back, uh, contractions uh, for these factory orders. And again, you know, if you look at a chart here, I mean, you're going to see that this looks like it's a weakening economy, you know, and look at the look at the um, the jobs numbers. In fact, my son Spencer on his uh, Twitter account, he put up some very interesting charts that he happened to make on his own. This look, this is a 16 year old kid. You know, it's the summer and he's out there trying to compose charts. But he put up some very nice charts following the uh, the ADP number that we got on Wednesday. And he has basically a three month moving average of one hundred and four thousand jobs. And his chart shows that this is the lowest that three-month moving hours has been in nine years. Take a look at that chart. I mean, we're totally rolling over uh, and we're about to go into the territory that we really haven't seen uh, since the 2008-2009 uh, recession. And for small businesses or very small businesses, that category where you have fewer than 20 employees, the three-month and the six-month moving averages have had their sharpest year-over-year -year declines since November and March of 2009. So you have certain parts of the labor market, employment market, acting uh, as weak as they've been since the Great Recession. So these are leading indicators. As I said on the last report, that the small businesses are leading the way for the large businesses, that the generals are ultimately going to follow the troops. What we're seeing in small business is going to be repeated in larger businesses. And of course, when the larger businesses start laying off their workers, the layoffs are much bigger. In fact, I just read, you know, Lowe's uh, was laying off thousands of workers and they were citing rising labor costs as the reason for the layoffs. And then they were gonna try to replace these workers through automation and through outsourcing. But this is what's going on, right? As everybody is talking about how strong the labor market is, uh, if you look beneath the surface, you'll see all the cracks uh, that show the market is actually weakening. And of course, by the time we see these huge negative non-farm payroll numbers, by the time we see big layoffs, well, we're already in recession, right? Because employment is a lagging indicator, right? You're not going to uh, learn about a recession coming by looking at uh, the unemployment rate. Because by the time the recession hits, that's when the unemployment rate spikes up. Because again, most employers do not lay off their people anticipating a recession. They generally get caught off guard by the recession. So they react to the recession. After the recession hits, then they, they, may, they, they start laying off people. In fact, unemployment typically peaks out towards the end of the recession, right? So when the recovery re begins, unemployment is at the highest, right? So if people were just looking at unemployment, when recoveries are starting and recessions are ending, unemployment is very high, right? Unemployment starts to come down after the economy begins to recover. So you can't look at these lagging indicators and think you're, you know, you're, you're gleaming anything about what's going to happen to the economy. But you have to look beneath the surface to see the earlier signs uh, of cracks in, in the foundation. And those signs are there. I mean, if a 16-year-old can find them, I mean, what's, what's everybody else's excuse? Why, you know, why can't these Wall Street economists 
uh, you know, find out what a 16-year-old kid can do on a summer vacation. Anyway, let's take a look at the markets because we probably had, I think, the worst week of the year in the stock market. And again, of course, this was the week that we got the rate cut. And what was I saying about the market? It would be a buy the rumor, sell the fact. And that's exactly what we had in the stock market, right? The stock market sold off as a result of the rate cuts. In fact, we've been, I think we're down four days in a row. And this is, again, as I said, the worst week of the year. I think the NASDAQ was down almost 4%, 3.9%. Uh, the Dow, not as bad. I think we're down 2.6% on the Dow Jones. You know, the Russell 2000 is now down 12% from its highs. Again, it was down 1% today. Uh, pretty bad week for the Russell slipping back into official correction territory. Remember, Wall Street says if you're down more than 10% from the high, you're in a correction. And if you're down more than 20%, you're in a bear market. Now we're down 12%. So the Russell 2000 is the first of the indexes to return to official correction territory. And I also think it will be the first index to get back into official bear market territory, which is down more than 20%. But it's not going to be the last. All of these major indexes are going to be back in bear market territory. Now, I have believed and I have maintained the entire time that despite the Dow and the S&P or the NASDAQ making new highs, that this has been a bear market. Now, and I said the rally was a correction. Now, typically, corrections don't take markets to new highs. So that does make this kind of an odd correction. But if we go out and make new lows, I don't think we had a bear market, then a, you know, then a bull market, and then another bear market, right? I think it's all part of the same bear market. And of course, the broader averages did not make new highs. The New York Stock Exchange Composite did not make new highs. The vast majority of stocks did not make new highs. You had a handful of stocks that were masking uh, the weakness that was happening underneath those averages. So I still think that even though this rally technically took out some highs, it barely did it. I mean, we barely made new highs and we couldn't hold them. And now we're rolling over. So I think it was a particularly sharp uh, bear market rally. It really was a sucker rally. In fact, it was so strong that it actually made new highs, suckering in more longs and scaring out more shorts. But I think we've been in a bear market for quite some time. This is a stealth bear market, but pretty soon it's not going to be nearly as stealth because a lot more people are going to realize that we are in the bear market. Uh, the bond market, though, had a great week. We did not have a buy the rumor, sell the fact there, unless, of course, people were anticipating that the yield curve would steepen, that if the Fed cut rates, people would be more optimistic on the economy. And if they're more optimistic on the economy, they're going to expect long-term interest rates to rise. I think what really threw the monkey wrench into the bond market was the Fed uh, being more hawkish, uh, indicating that maybe it would be one and done, well, maybe not, and they're not so sure. And so because of all this uncertainty over whether or not the markets would be getting more rate cuts, the bond market is more concerned that the recession will not be averted that the recession is going to be here. And of course, also uh, the higher tariffs, Trump imposing extra tariffs, uh, that raises the ante on the uncertainty in the global economy. And that helps send uh, foreign bond prices rising and rates plunging, which also brought our rates down uh, in, in sympathy with those rates. The dollar, on the other hand, actually was relatively flat on the week. I mean, it had a big rally intra-week, uh, but then sold off. And the dollar index uh, was a little bit higher. I mean, a couple of ticks higher on the week. But again, beneath the surface, the dollar was very weak against the Japanese yen. It was very weak against the Swiss franc. And those are currencies that are typically thought of as safe havens. I mean, the dollar is thought as a safe haven too, but it's not as safe as the Swiss franc or the yen, at least in the eyes of the traders. And of course, gold, the safe haven asset, Gold had a great week. I think it was up about 1.7%. It finished today down, I think, a couple of bucks. Uh, it was down maybe 13, 15 bucks at one point overnight and then came back and it went positive, but it couldn't quite make it all the way up to 1450. That still seems like the resistance. And I think we closed around 1440, 1441 off, uh, you know, three or four bucks on the day but a pretty good recovery. And as I said, had we actually had 
a, a weaker than expected jobs number, I mean, a jobs report that people considered weak, uh, then we might have been able to break through that 1450. But I still think we are going to break through it. We probably will break through it maybe next week. Uh, but that is the resistance, in my opinion, and we still have a lot of support uh, down at 1400 as evidenced by this week's trading action. Oil prices managed to recover a buck seventy. I forgot to mention oil prices yesterday. They plunged by, I think, over $4 a barrel, one of the weakest days in a long time in the crude oil market. And again, the total catalyst for that crude oil decline uh, was the tariffs, was the uh, announcement of the tariffs, again, which is getting people to be concerned about a global economic slowdown. And if the economy is slowing down, if we're going into a recession, well, we're going to have less demand for oil. And that is why oil prices fell. Again, remember, I thought, and I, I mentioned on the last podcast, that the reason that Trump wanted to impose these extra tariffs was to put additional pressure on the Fed to keep cutting rates. And in fact, as of today, the odds now of a September rate cut have now surged to 100%. So there was some certainty, you know, uncertainty rather. I think the odds had maybe gone down to 50%. I'm not actually sure uh, on the Wednesday uh, after the Fed statement, uh, but now they're back up at 100% that we're going to get a rate cut in, uh, in September. But the markets are still maybe concerned that the Fed is not going to deliver enough uh, uh, monetary heroin to the markets. I think the markets are wrong. The Fed is going to deliver. They're going to deliver all the way down to zero. The problem is uh, it's not going to produce the high that the markets are hoping for. Uh, it's going to produce an overdose uh, that nobody even believes is possible. Remember, everybody is surprised, right? Everybody on Wall Street is completely shocked that the Fed is cutting rates now. I mean, they expected it, but they didn't expect it six, seven months ago, right? And there's, you know, they also didn't expect the Fed to end quantitative easing. Right? Well, I expected both of those things to happen. And the reason that I was right and you know most people on Wall Street were wrong is because I understand the dynamics of what's going on and they don't. I understand the mistakes that the Fed is making and they don't. And so because they weren't expecting this, right? they also don't understand why it happened. They're believing the Fed's lies. Remember, not only did I say the Fed was going to cut rates and stop shrinking the balance sheet, but I also said they would make up an excuse as to why they were doing it because they weren't going to tell the truth. Well, the people who didn't see this coming don't know the Fed is making this up, right? Although, I mean, there's so many things that should be suspicious about these cuts when they're saying how great the economy is and then somehow trying to blame it on what's going on overseas when, you know, things are even weaker here. I mean, look, the Russell 2000, I just said that's the first index to return to uh, correction mode. That is the most domestically sensitive index. So if it's the foreign economies that are all screwed up and the U.S. economy is great, why is the index that is most sensitive to the domestic economy doing the worst? Why are the stocks that are more sensitive to what's happening overseas doing better than the ones that are completely focused on the domestic economy? I mean, the Fed is just making this stuff up, but the people on Wall Street uh, just still don't understand it. So they're going to be surprised again by what happens. And I think the next surprise is going to is going to be even bigger than the last one. And it's going to cost them a lot more money. You know, speaking about gold, though, I wanted to make a point because I read an interesting article. You know, even though last month during the month of uh, July, uh, gold prices hit a six year high. Right. Well, you would think that a lot of Americans were buying gold, right, helping to push it to a six six uh, year high. Well, they're not. If you look at sales of uh, from the U.S. Mint of U.S. gold coins, uh, in July, this was the lowest uh, month, or maybe the lowest July, in 12 years. 12-year 12 low in, in gold sales, as gold itself is hitting a six-year high. What's going on? Again, I've explained this before. The typical American gold buyer is a Trump fan, right? They're Republicans, and they like Trump. And because they support Trump, they believe everything Trump says. They believe the economy is in great shape, right? And that it's booming. Well, if you believe the U.S. economy is booming and everything is fantastic, you don't feel the need to buy gold. I mean, a lot of people buy gold if they're worried about the economy. They're worried about the future. We had a lot of people buying gold when Obama was president, right? Because they were worried about the economy. And a lot of those people who bought gold paid higher prices 
uh, than uh, the price is now, right? Gold went up to 1900 when Obama was president and people were so worried about Obama that they bid it all the way up there, right? Well, now they're not worried uh, and so they're not buying. And also, you know, everybody says there's no inflation. There is, but people keep saying there is none. Well, gold's an inflation hedge. Well, if you have no inflation to hedge, well, what's the point in buying gold? So you're not seeing uh, the gold buying uh, in America. And I've you know, talked about that at Shift Gold. I mean, sales at Shift Gold are way down. And every gold dealer I talk to has the same complaint. Business is way down. And it is because all the Trump voters have so much false optimism about the future. The sad part is they're wrong, right? Things are going to get really bad. And Trump may not be the president in two more years. And then all these Republicans are going to be scared shitless and they're going to be buying gold. The problem is they'll probably be paying more than $2,000 an ounce for it. So they passed up on the opportunity to buy at $1,100 and $1,200 and $1,300 and $1,400 because they believed all the lies about how great the economy is. Well, when there's a Democrat in the White House and a socialist to boot and we have a socialist Congress and, you know, well, they're not going to believe the lies anymore and they're going to be back in the gold market. The problem is the prices are going to be all time record highs. So people should be buying gold now rather than waiting for uh, the socialists to come to office. Of course, I don't know how much uh, gold demand was shifted to cryptocurrencies. I don't think there's that much, but it is interesting that since Trump has been president, the gold buyers haven't been buying, but the crypto buyers have, right? The crypto people are in there speculating, even though the traditional American gold buyers are not there. Now, I don't think most of those guys are buying crypto. I don't think they're buying anything, but it shows you that the two assets don't have much in common because you're, you were seeing the demand for crypto and you were not seeing the demand for gold. In fact, I do believe that one of the reasons that uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies were able to spin this narrative was that while uh, the gold buyers were on strike because they were so confident in the economy, right, the price of gold wasn't going up. But since it was easier to move the price of Bitcoin because it's such a small market and didn't take a lot of volume, as the Bitcoin price was going up, uh, that was, you know they were able to market it as being superior to gold because gold was standing still. Nobody was making money in gold, but everybody was making money in crypto. And so maybe that was a way to drive demand for crypto. But believe me, by the time gold really starts taking off, and it will take off, uh, crypto would have already crashed. And if it hadn't, well, it soon will. In fact, you know Bitcoin did have a bit of a rally uh, on the anticipation that I think the Chinese we're going to step in and buy, right? I mentioned on my last podcast yesterday, Bitcoin was trading at about 10,500. It had jumped up about 5%. And I think people were trying to front run a China trade, right? People were thinking, aha, you know, the Chinese are going to be concerned about escalating trade war. The yuan could fall, right? They're just going to buy Bitcoin as a hedge. So I think people ran into the market to try to front run that, right? So they can buy in advance and profit from the, the Chinese buying. Well, when the Chinese market opened, we, we didn't gain any headway. And, you know, as I'm talking, we're back, you know, we're at uh, 10,400. We haven't gained anything. I think intraday we did get above 10,600 or at one point, uh, but we couldn't hold. And again, you know, if you look at the way Bitcoin has been trading, to me, somebody big or several big people are big are trying to get out. The whales are selling. They're just hoping not to make a big splash so that the minions or the minnows rather won't notice that the whales are getting out. But every rally is being sold. Anytime there's demand, they're selling into it. Uh, so there is a movement right now trying to get out. And it makes sense, right? Bitcoin went all the way up to 20,000. Then it crashed down to 3,000. The bubble popped. Now they're able to get it back up to 10,000, kind of 50% replacement. But 10,000 is a great level to get out at if the bubble has already popped. And I think that's what the big money is trying to do. In fact, you know, when you get all these guys saying, hey, you know, don't you want to buy it because it can double, it can go to 100,000? Look, the odds of it doing that are slim. But you know what? There are a lot of other assets that could double in price from here, right, that aren't going to go to zero, right? If you think Bitcoin is going to go from 10,000 to 20,000, you just double your money. I mean, just buy some silver. I think it's a lot easier for silver to double. And you know what? Silver is not going to zero. Because if Bitcoin doesn't double, it can go to zero. 
If silver doesn't double now, it's going to double eventually, and it's never going to go to zero. So if you want to think about a risk reward when it comes to Bitcoin, even if you believe there's upside in Bitcoin, there's not enough to justify the downside. And there are other assets that you can buy right now that have a lot of upside as well, if you want to speculate, that don't have nearly as much downside as, uh, as Bitcoin. You know, I continue to, to read all these articles on the internet. And if you search my name on Google, you'll, you'll find them all. But the Bitcoin community is still trying to find ways to, uh, you know, redefine my narrative to show everybody that I'm coming around the Bitcoin. I mean, they're even reporting on the debate I had with Pompliano and somehow is more evidence that I'm coming around. I'm slowly changing my mind. I'm warming up to Bitcoin. I'm embracing Bitcoin. I mean, why does the Bitcoin community feel that they have to trick everybody else into thinking that, you know, that I'm a convert, that I've gone from being anti-Bitcoin to pro-Bitcoin when I haven't changed my opinion at all, right? Again, this is all part of the fake news that defines uh, Bitcoin and the, the attempts uh, to, uh, you know, to hype it up and to try to get people to buy by trying to convince them that I've changed my mind. When if you actually listen to anything that I've said, you'll find that I haven't changed my mind at all. I mean, sometimes they try to use the fact that I that I say, yeah, I regret not buying it. Like, oh, if I'd have bought Bitcoin when it was $10, oh, I made a mistake. I could have made so much money. Of course, of course I could have made a lot of money. But that doesn't mean I changed my mind. I mean, I would be an idiot, right? What am I supposed to say if somebody says, well, don't you wish you bought it when it was $10? What am I supposed to say? No? I mean, what kind of idiot would say no? I mean, if something's at 10,000, right? Don't I wish I bought it at 10? But that doesn't change my opinion, right? Just because, you know, it, it went up, it didn't mean I was wrong on my fundamental analysis. And I, I still think fundamentally it's going to collapse. But I would be a liar if I said I don't regret not buying it when I, you know, at that time. But people are trying to spin that into the fact that now I like it. I'm, I'm, I'm warming up to it. I'm coming around because I regret not buying it. Well, I mean, but I'm saying I'm not going to buy it now. Just because I regret not buying it at 10 doesn't mean I'm going to buy it at 10,000, right? I mean, because that's what happens sometimes in a, in, a, in a bubble is that first, you know, people are too afraid to buy it because, but then they, their greed takes over and then they, they can't take it anymore and they jump in, right? And then they get killed. I'm not... I'm not going to make that mistake. But probably one of the funniest uh, things I've seen about me and Bitcoin, there's this YouTube video that's out there by this woman who claims that she's like body language ghost. I mean, that's the name of her YouTube channel. And this thing has got um, almost 15,000 views already. And basically what she did is she copied the interview I did with Kitgo. Uh... And it's the, it, the interview that, I mean, Kitco broke the interview into three segments. And one segment had to do with Bitcoin. And even, even Kitco's headline was misleading. It was like, is Peter Schiff the newest Bitcoin convert, right? I mean, you don't even have to ask that question, right? It's obvious what the answer is. But again, they're trying to create the false impression. And of course, maybe getting people to click on it because they're hoping that I'm going to convert, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get all in on on Bitcoin, but this woman just basically puts up that whole interview and then she overlays her analysis of the interview from my body language, right? And if you listen to the whole thing, basically I'm scared, I'm lying, I'm a con man, I'm nervous. And she keeps pointing out all these things that I'm doing with my hands, my eyes, my shoulders, uh, my mouth, right? And where it indicates deception or lies or nervousness. Meanwhile, if you actually look at me, I'm not doing anything. You can't even notice any change in any part of my body, right? There's no mannerisms. There's nothing going on with my shoulders, my hands, with eyes, absolutely nothing. I mean, everything she's saying that I'm doing, I'm not doing. I mean, it's almost like she's not even paying attention to me. She just kind of made up a script because obviously this woman uh, is a Bitcoin bug, right? And so she wants to discredit me because I don't believe in Bitcoin. And so she puts out this fake analysis of my supposed body language to show that I'm, I'm lying, that I secretly love Bitcoin and I'm having to lie about it. And I'm just trying to push people into gold because I'm a salesman and I'm, I'm nervous and I can't handle these questions because I know I'm lying. I mean, one, I mean, first of all, 
I was calm as a cucumber. I wasn't nervous at all. I wasn't scared about anything. I was completely honest, right? Just like I am on every interview. And this thing is all BS, right? I mean, she's basically making this up to try to somehow suggest, aha, you see, I've caught him. See, I proved with my, my great analysis of his body language that he's lying uh, um, and he's a con man and a fraud, right? So therefore, we can disregard everything he has to say about Bitcoin. Uh, and of course, it's her video that's a fraud. It's a lie, right? And, and it's almost like everything about Bitcoin. I mean, is there, is there nothing honest about this whole thing? Can, can nobody who is touting Bitcoin tell the truth about anything? Is the whole thing a lie built on a lie and then puffed up with more lies? That's what it seems like. And it seems like it's just more desperation on the part of uh, the Bitcoin community to prop up that price and to try to get more people into it. Meanwhile, look at the search volume. Search volume again. After that spike up that we had uh, when Bitcoin ran up to 13, 14,000, uh, search volume has collapsed. It's almost all the way back down where it started. I mean, all of the interest in Bitcoin was a function of the coverage that surrounded the price going up. That's the only thing that people are interested in is the rising price. That's why, or another reason why people in Bitcoin want to get the price up, because they know a rising price is the only thing that people find interesting about it, because you can't do anything with it. It doesn't have any real value unless it's going up. And then people can theoretically buy it and make money selling it to somebody else who thinks it's going higher. But the minute it stops going up, there's no interest. That's why the Chinese didn't buy, right? People, oh, the Chinese are going to buy. They're not buying. They didn't show up, right? They're not there. I mean, if a few Chinese were dumb enough to buy, there was a whale who was smart enough to sell to them. But if we're not getting big moves up in Bitcoin now, right, when this is when it used to go up a few years ago when something would happen, there'd be a crisis and you'd get real move, not a four or 5% move. That's nothing for Bitcoin. The fact that Bitcoin can only go from 10,000 to 10,600, that's it. That's the most it could do with all this stuff going on. That shows you that the bubble has burst and the air is coming out. I want to wrap up the podcast though, talking about Europe again, because uh, now the entire German government Bund uh, yield curve is negative, negative all the way out to 30 years. The German government can sell a 30 year Bund at a negative yield. Now the yield is only slightly negative when you go out 30 years, but the fact that it's negative at all is would seem crazy, right? Because normally governments, they have a choice. They can pay for their spending through taxation or they can borrow the money. Now, when they borrow the money, you know, they have to pay interest. So it's generally cheaper to pay for things with taxes than debt. But a lot of times the voters like it because the taxes, you get the bill right, right away. But if you borrow it, right, the bill comes due over time, right? So a lot of times politicians like to borrow the money because the taxpayers don't feel all the costs right away. It gets passed on even to uh, different generations. But here you have a situation where the German government can actually fund its spending cheaper by borrowing the money than through current taxation, which makes no sense because, again, there is a time value of money. It's better to have money today than have money in 30 years. Yet here you have people paying uh, the German government uh, not to give them their money for 30 years. And at first glance, you'd say, well, there's absolutely nothing about this that makes sense. But there is one thing about it that does make sense. And in a way it's actually worth it to pay a negative yield on German government bonds versus having a bank account in euros. And, and, and this is what I think is going on in, the, uh, in that market. I think that people who are buying German bonds are willing to pay a premium as an insurance policy against the collapse of the euro. Because there is a probability over the next 30 years that the euro disintegrates, that the whole thing blows apart, right? That the experiment fails and national currencies return to the eurozone. Well, what happens if you have euros, right? And the euro goes away. What do you get? Nobody really knows, right? But I would say that if you're living in Italy and you have a bank account and you have um, euros deposited at an Italian bank and, and the whole thing falls apart or even... Italy leaves the eurozone on its own, what's going to happen to your euros in that bank? 
Well, they're probably going to turn into lira. I mean, that would be my guess. I mean, nobody knows for sure, but that might seem like a reasonable uh, conclusion that if you have a bank account in Italy and the euro falls apart, your euros are going to become lira. And, you know, if you're in Greece, you're going to end up with drachma. If you're in Spain, you're going to end up with uh, pesetas, right? That's what's going to happen. If you're in France, you're going to get francs. Well, a lot of people don't want those currencies. Believe me, if you get those currencies back, you're not going to want them. They're going to be collapsing. Now, if you have a deposit in a German bank, well, you'll probably get marks, which is better. But I don't know. I mean, we don't know for sure. I mean, I would much rather have a bank account in Germany than have one in, in France or Italy. But the one thing that is probably pretty certain is if you own a bond, right? So if you own a French government bond and the euro goes away, the French government is going to repay you in francs, right? Because there's going to be no more euros. So they're going to give you francs because that's what they can print, right? But if you have a German government bund, Germany is going to give you marks, Deutschmarks, right? So if you want to make sure that if the euro breaks apart, you've got a Deutschmark and not a drachma or a peseta, what do you do? You have to buy German government bunds because anything else you buy, you don't know what the hell you're going to get, right? And so if, if I'm going to end up with a currency in Europe, I want the mark, right? I don't want the drachma or the peseta, and I'm sure a lot of people do. And so as rates are coming down and people have a choice between buying a bond that may become a drachma or that may become a lira or a peseta or buying one that may become uh, a Deutschmark, I'm going to buy the bond that might be a Deutschmark. And that's even worth paying a negative rate of interest. Because if I'm just going to leave euros, if you're in Greece, you're going to leave your euros in a Greek bank, you're not getting any interest on them. So you're just sitting there, but you have the risk that you wake up one morning and you got drachma. I would rather just take my euros and buy a German government bund. Even if I have to pay a little bit of negative interest, I can sleep better at night knowing worst case scenario, I'm going to wake up with uh, marks and not drachma. So I think that's another uh, aspect of this that nobody really seems to appreciate. Anyway, speaking about Europe, I am headed off to Europe uh, next week. I'm, I may be able to do one more podcast on Monday, uh, depending on what goes on on Monday. Maybe I'll try to get one in. I'm not sure. But then I also have to pack because I'm leaving uh, for Italy uh, for almost two weeks or 10 days in Italy. And then I'm going straight back to um, Puerto Rico. And today, apparently, the governor is stepping down today. So a lot of stuff going on in Puerto Rico. But I'm going to Italy. And you might think, why am I going there in, in, in August? It's going to be hot. And I'm not even going to beaches. That's believe it. I get plenty of beaches in Puerto Rico. But I'm going there. My friend uh, Simon Black, who some of you might know from Sovereign Man, he has this, I guess, kind of retreat. He rents this house in Umbria, a large house, maybe like 25, 30 bedrooms, four or 500-year-old place. And he's been renting it, and he has a lot of his subscribers. They come out. And so this year, I decided to go uh, and hang out there. And, you know, my son Spencer wanted to come, so he's coming with me. And he's never been uh, to Europe before, so we're going to go to Italy. So while I'm there, we're going to do a little sightseeing. Hopefully, the heat wave backs up a little bit because we're going to be in Rome. Uh, then we're going to be in Florence and then Venice. And then we come back from Venice. We fly into Rome. Uh, but while I am in Italy, I'm not really sure how many podcasts I'm going to do. I mean, obviously, I'm going to take my laptop, so I could do some, but I'll probably be, uh, you know, doing fewer than I might normally do because, you know, the hours are going to be different. I'm traveling and trying to have a little fun. It is more of a vacation, maybe a little bit of a working vacation, but more of a vacation. And then I'm going directly back to Puerto Rico. And once I get back to Puerto Rico, uh, then obviously I'll be able to uh, uh, do more podcasts. But my summer vacation here in Connecticut is coming to an end and I'm going to be back uh, to Puerto Rico where I spend the vast majority of my time now because I am a Puerto Rican resident. And I tell you, I, you know, I, I, whenever I watch these democratic debates, I am happy that I'm living in Puerto Rico because as I said, there is a very good chance that one of these clowns is going to be uh, the next president. And he's promising to tax the hell out of people. And at least if I'm in Puerto Rico, he can't tax the hell out of me. In fact, even Trump, you know, Trump is using that line at his rally last night. Trump was saying that he's going to tax the hell out of the Chinese. Tax the hell. I mean, why do we want to support 
a Republican president who wants to tax the hell out of anybody. Because, of course, if he wants to tax the hell out of the Chinese, the Chinese don't pay the tax. He's taxing the hell out of Americans. That's who he's taxing. And, of course, the Democrats, they want to tax the hell out of the rich. But the rich aren't going to pay the taxes. They're taxing the middle class. They're taxing the poor. And the biggest tax of all is going to be inflation. Everyone's going to get hit with that tax. But I'm not getting hit with either. Right? I'm not going to get hit with the income tax because I'm in Puerto Rico, right? and I'm exempt from the U.S. income tax. No matter how high these clowns raise it, no matter how high they raise the capital gains tax, I don't have to pay it, and I ain't paying the inflation tax because I don't own dollars. right? They, the U.S. government can't tax me with inflation if I'm not holding dollars, if I've got foreign assets, if I've got foreign stocks, if I've got gold. I'm not paying the inflation tax, which is why I am you know, recommending that anybody who's listening to me, I mean, avoid that tax. I mean, if you can't move to Puerto Rico, which I would recommend that you do, right? Get out now while the getting's good, right? But if you can't come down to Puerto Rico, and by the way, it's not, you know, my wife tells me she thinks it's the best decision I ever made. I mean, it's a great lifestyle too, apart from the fact that you save on taxes. But if you're not going to do that, if you're not going to get out of Dodge before the bullets start flying, at least protect yourself from the inflation tax. That's easy. You don't have to go anywhere. You just have to send your money to Euro Pacific Capital so that I can manage it. I can get you in my mutual funds. I can get you into foreign stocks. I can get you into gold stocks. You can buy some physical gold and escape that tax because the inflation tax is actually the biggest tax that everybody is going to pay. They just don't know that they're going to pay it. <music>